next part of our evening is dedicated to happy horse, happy life, and how to talk to horse. And the questions mostly come from the insiders, plus me, a happy horse, happy life instructor. And unfortunately, I didn't put her name with it, so I don't remember which one, but she wrote that while it's great that horse enthusiasts are engaged in horsemanship programs all over the world, at Happy Horse, Happy Life, you've created a whole new level of horsemanship understanding, but many people don't know yet what it means. Would you tell us how powerful and how empowering your no program is for humans and horses? Well, thank you very much. And I'm not the one that's going to tell you how empowering it is. Everybody else will. And, you know, that's what's happening. But I do want to speak to how I um, evolved to this point. And, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and I've been lucky to study with some of the best horsemen on the planet uh, world famous names in dressage and eventing and um, jumping and uh, not to mention on the education and marketing side, but mentors like Walter Zettel and Christoph Hess and now Louis Lucio, who I work with. Of course, Pat, you know, made a big difference in my life. I learned so much. And then when, you know, I came out on my own, I'm like, what am I going to do? I was part of creating what at that time I thought was the best program in the world. And then I realized how many holes I was seeing and not just, you know, in the program I co-created, but looking all around, I'm going, what are people missing? And I really realized that most things are technique driven. You know, it's like how to hold a rope, how to hold your reins, how to sit, how to get your horse to do this. It's all, you know, technical. And what I saw was that people were missing the psychology part, they were missing the feel. And so when I would ask people about their problems, that, hey, the problems are, I'm gonna just pick up my dog. Not that I'm a slave to my dog. I'm known for horse training, not dog if, training. If we don't have either a cat or a oh, um, dog show up, then it's not a Zoom teleconference. So yeah, thank God we're all <laughs> animal lovers. Anyway, so I saw that, you know, no matter how good people were, at dressage or jumping or eventing or reining or uh, natural horsemanship or whatever, they still had all the same problems. And those problems uh, all drilled back to the same root, lack of connection. The horse was distracted. The horse cared about something else more than the person that they were with. They weren't focused on the same outcome. They had different levels of energy. The horses weren't relaxed. They were tense. They were resistant. Uh, the horses did not respond to light aids. Like, yeah. you know, people could get horses to do things, but sometimes it took a lot of pressure and they were kind of happy that they got the horse to do something. But if you looked at their faces, the horse and the human weren't really that happy. It took strong aids. And then confidence, you know, either the person was unconfident or the horse was unconfident. So when I looked at all of that, you know, okay, great. I could see all these different problems that people had with their horses. And then when I said to them, well, how, if connection, lack of connection is the problem, what do you do to get a horse connected? And everyone's like, <laughs> I don't know. And then I'd say, and how do you get a horse relaxed? I don't know. How do you get a horse to respond to light aids? I really don't know. <laughs> and so I went, that's what I have to teach because I'm not teaching techniques. I'm teaching you how to get a horse to connect with you and stay connected. I'm teaching you how to get a horse relaxed and, and be happy to just be with you and not tense and, and worried about stuff. I'm teaching you how to get a horse to respond to light aids. I'm teaching you how to get a horse to be confident. Then I'm teaching you how to have impulsion. Nobody really knows what that means. I'm teaching you how to get a horse supple. Nobody knows what that means. And then harmony is what everybody wants, but how to get it, everybody's going about it the wrong way. They either are getting in harmony with their horse where they just do what the horse wants. Like if a horse wants to eat grass and you let it eat grass, you're in harmony. As soon as you say, I don't want you to eat grass, 
some horses are going to mm -hmm. fight you on it. Well, how do you get the horse to want you more than the grass? So, I mean, it took me several months to develop this, a lot of thinking and going, how do I, how do I teach people these things? It's way beyond techniques. So um, when I started playing around with it, it changed how I approached my horses for a lot better results. And then when I started teaching it and, and um, testing it on my students, you know, that are around me long-term here at Happy Horse Haven, I was shocked at how quickly it worked. And then when I taught my first clinic using my How to Talk Horse curriculum, <laughs> all the problems that everybody said that they had were over by lunchtime. Wow. By lunchtime. I had never seen that in the 30 years I've been teaching I had never seen results like that so rapidly. And um, after this happening three times, like at three of my master classes and clinics, I went, you know what? I can confidently tell people once we go through all their problems, I can say, well, most of these will be fixed by lunchtime. And everyone looks at me and goes, yes, yeah, sure. And they are. That's most cool. of them. Because... The problem is connection. The problem is relaxation. The problem is responsiveness, which are the core behaviors. And if you address the core behaviors, it's done. But if you don't address the disconnection or the relaxation, or you don't do it properly, you don't get horses to understand your communication. Now you're going to be in a, a wrestling match for, I don't know, 10, 20 years, which most people are. I know people who are professionals in natural horsemanship, a high level graduates in natural horsemanship are very experienced, have done 20, 30 years almost. Well, can't be 30 years because that was me, but you know, 25 years plus in yeah. natural horsemanship. And they still have these problems because mm -hmm. what is being taught doesn't address those problems. You might stumble across them. So I wanted to make something that really address those problems and helped empower people to read the horse, learn how to use their energy, know the root of the problem, fix it so they could then go on and, and achieve their purpose in harmony with a happy horse. Oh my gosh, it's lovely. And Linda, this leads to the next question. It's naturally, uh, Linda, I've used your techniques of equine psychology with my horses successfully for some time now. I think your new curriculum, How to Talk Horse, is groundbreaking in its ease of application. How would you explain the power of your curriculum to someone who is just starting out on their relationship-based horsemanship journey? How would I explain the power of it? Yeah, how to talk to horse in its... It's ease of application, and if if I'm a new person coming along, is how, how do you explain your curriculum? Yeah, um, I won't explain it. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to push my ideas on somebody. I would go for the connection first. I would say, you know, what kind of things are you dealing with with your horse? What are your problems? What are your goals? I would get to know them and then teach them how to solve it. Instead of saying, I have this little package in a box and you should use it. First, I wanna make sure that somebody feels like they need it. And if they're perfectly happy, then, you know, they're not gonna want anything. And a lot of people, you know, they'll, I find people, um, ask questions that make you feel like you have to defend yourself and defend what you're doing, or you have to promote and evangelize what you're doing, rather than say, well, if somebody goes, well, what is this thing that you're doing? Instead of going, well, I'm going to tell you because they don't listen, I would go, well, you know, it's, it's really learning how to communicate with your horse. What do you do with your horse? What kind of problems do you have? You know, do you have any frustrations? And what's interesting is most people have so many problems, but it's normal. So they don't think they have anything that they need to improve. You ask the horse, it'll say something different. But most people are kind of comfortably numb 
with the everyday issues that they have with their horses, they don't even realize how much better it could be. And I think that's the biggest problem that we have with relationship-based horsemanship because people think, oh, that just means you give them treats and you do positive reinforcement and you love on them and, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. I think that's the biggest problem with this part of the industry. They don't see how that relates to better performance or less injuries or a lot of people don't really care about a happy horse or they can't tell that their horse is unhappy. They can't. So a lot of it uh, has to do with education, you know, getting people to realize or see things with new eyes. So rather than trying to tell them, you know, how good this is, I try to be a good example. And then I ask them, you know, what are their problems and what are their goals and what's getting in the way of reaching it? And then when they say, oh, this, 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 it's like, well, you know, there's something that can help them. That's awesome. I love it. Putting the position from the customer first. Yeah, exactly. Because we want to, and it, you know, it's really how we treat horses, you know, in this idea is that we don't just push our ideas on a horse. We ask them a question and we invite a conversation rather than I'm going to tell the horse what to do, you know, which is what we tend to do with people also. It's the truth. And I, 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 you know, Linda, we, um, one of the things that's been coming up in these teleconferences for a while is this idea of the relationship. Uh, and we've had several different speakers. We had David Lichman and Jennifer Zellig's, and we had several speakers, you know, on the show. And it's been really neat because each of them has been giving us a different view of how to show up for your horse and start to listen to the horse and, and let the horse have a, have a participation in this. It, it's just been huge for Sonny and me. You, you know, Sonny, we've been together. This is our 18th year together. <laughs> yeah, Sonny turned 27. He's going to, and he's still carrying me to, um, a, I just got a blue ribbon with him last weekend and, and he's still going. But one of the things that took off for us was when I started to show up and go, what, how are you feeling today, buddy? What are you into? It, it's unbelievable. And the, so, so one of the challenges, and I, and, and I think what you're telling me, because um, frankly, I've been a little busy integrating a couple of nonprofits <laughs> and not paying enough attention to your program. And I think, you know, I got to see you in, Carmel twice, and I got to see you in Florida. But the fact is, I didn't get to see you because I've been working. I was working Absolutely. the whole time, shaking hands, working on creating this, you know, building this, um, because I knew the time would come when I'd get to focus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> really I you. But in this, let me let me lead this into the next question because I think it it flows. So I I told you I see I saw you here in California twice and I saw you in February three of our officers along with me four of us were able to celebrate the merger and we wanted to make it really quick because we just got everybody agreed and we were like we we're not going to miss another year so we were catching planes to Florida struggling to get there and we we're so glad we were Dr. Hollenbeck made it um, Lisa Trueblood made it she's our secretary and of course our um, chief veterinary officer who's on the call um, I hope I hope Dr. Hollenbeck made the call. I don't I can't see everybody that's here, but he was planning to. Um, and we just had a ball. And we had a ball getting to know you and and Sue and and the instructors. And it was phenomenal. But here's what happened. When I was there, I was so blown away by how little stimulus that you <laughs> and each one of the, you know, Courtney and and the Jesse and Christy, Christy, all of you were just like incredibly light, like I've never seen it before. And I know that we've gone through these kind of ups and downs of lightness versus where do you find that equilibrium? And so here I was sitting next to Jesse, which means, of course, that I was looking 
like up <laughs> like this because Jesse even sitting down is probably taller than I am standing up. And Jesse and I had a relationship going back to Pagosa Springs. So I actually studied with him. And I said, Jesse, I said, this is just incredible how light it is. And he said, Andrew, there aren't any more phases. We're not using the phases. And I, and I wanted to fall out of my chair because my paradigm is based on suggest, act, tell, cause. And it's, it's just so built into for the 20 some odd years that I've been doing this. And so I've been dying to ask because I didn't get a chance to talk to Jesse about it. Haven't had a chance to talk to any of your instructors. And of course, what a wonderful time. And people even, I told some people, I was going to ask the question and they're all looking forward to the answer of. Better be a good answer. Uh, now. That's a big build up. level of lightness in your program and in this apparent change of approach to phases. Can you explain that? Yes, I think it's because I'm getting past the techniques and I'm focusing on connection and conversation. And so um, when you, like I found that, I mean, obviously I used to teach that. And once I was on my own and I was free to do what I felt was needed for the students and the horses, um, I found that people would keep going you know, well, what phase is that? And what phase should I use? And I'm always having to go to phase four or phase three. I'm like, why are you talking about phases? Why are you not communicating with your horse? The more you get stuck in the mechanics of it, the worse you are at connecting and communicating. So to me, um, it's, and this is what I teach, it's about ask your horse a question, ask him if he'll do something. And if he blows you off, you go, hey, I'm talking to you, ask again, but you don't shout at them. And if they don't understand, you don't keep going up your phases and getting stronger with AIDS because it's like somebody doesn't speak your language and now you're shouting at them. It's not- That's gonna, a great analogy. Uh, I love that analogy. Yeah. Understanding. And so I find that once I really teach people about connection and responsiveness, that their life changes because they start looking at the horse and thinking about communication and getting the horse to connect and they connect and that just goes away and the only time you have to really you know raise your energy is if a horse does something abrupt and big and you have to go hey look here stay here instead of I'm going to go up my phases to make you do something it doesn't need that so I don't talk about that at all. I talk about connection, relaxation, responsiveness, and I show people how to do that. But let me tell you, the connection part is the big one. When you have connection, you can whisper. It takes very, it. very little. When you don't have connection, you can yell and still not get the response that you are going for. So again, it comes back to what I said, you know, at the beginning, this is not technically oriented, it's more psychology oriented. And the, the kingpin is connection. And like I said, once you know how to connect with a horse, it's easy. And I find that because I'm so clear on that now, and I can just go straight to it and go, I know how to get a horse to connect. And that's what I do. That if I have to help somebody with a horse, and I'll step in and I can do it in such a short moment. And people go, why did that work so fast? And I went, because I know how to talk horse. That's why I called my curriculum that. It's you're learning how to converse and how to relate and, you know, have a, have a mutual understanding instead of just telling my horse what to do. And, you know, am I going to use positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement, or am I going to um, use phases or it's like, <sighs> when I'm talking to you, I'm not thinking about what technique I'm going to use. I'm connecting with you and I'm talking to you and everything comes naturally. Somebody asked me that. They said, how is your new program different? Cause everyone thinks I'm doing a watered down version of what I used to do, you know, it's like, no, I'm doing something completely different because I've seen the need and horsemanship has not evolved. And, you know, back in the day, Pat and I were the ones who, you know, made that next great leap in the horse industry. 
But since then it's stagnated. It's been stagnant for at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so what I looked at was what needs to change? And so when this you know, lady said, well, how is it different? Are you using positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement? I'm like, no, I'm having conversations with the horse. I'm not thinking about trick training or I reward you for this, or if you do that, I'll give you that. No, I want, I want this. That's the special part. And I want the horse to fall in love with me, not be waiting for a payout. And I'm not saying I'm against treats or positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. I think it all belongs in the mix. But if that's what we're thinking about, then we're not thinking about the connection with the horse. We're not connecting. We're thinking about when you do this, I'll reward it, whether it's negative or positive. Well, I love it. That actually flows into our next question from a, another happy horse, happy life insider. Would you talk about the power of reading horses' subtle body language? Because if you're going to talk with a horse, well, then sounds like you got to be listening to. Perhaps you could talk about that. Yes, you've got to become very observant. You've got to learn how to read horses. And um, in my program, I do lots of checklists and show people how to read a horse from nose to tail and you know what does this mean and what does that mean but I think it's not just the physical signs that we have to get good at it's reading energy and then adjusting our energy and to give you an idea of how I've, I've been doing this which has been working really successfully is in my master classes my clinics uh, the first part of the morning is all about problems and goals and what is the origin and root of those goals and then I talk about horse behavior and you know whether they're movers or stoppers extroverts or introverts mm -hmm. are they tense left brain or right brain right whatever way you want to say it I've got a very tactical model now that I use so people don't pigeonhole their horses they go what am I feeling if the horse is pushy what do I need to do if it's a mover what do I need to do so I teach them about that and then I talk about energy and I talk about, you know, is your, like, how much effort does a horse put into things? Or is he low key? Or is he big? Or is he small in his persona, right? In, in his energy. And what we have to do is match that. Because if you've got a very shy horse, and you're a big personality, you've immediately created a disconnect. So we get back to that connection thing. So if my horse moves slowly, how about I slow down? If my horse moves quickly, how about I speed up a little bit? If my horse is really like engaged and excited about things, how about I lift my game, but don't blow the horse up? So just right. find that way to relate to that horse's energy. And I tell people to go and do that. I said, now go get your horse. And I said, don't change anything. Just be aware of the energy matching your horse. And I'm telling you, from the moment they come into the arena, they go, my horse is completely different. But if I interviewed the horse, the horse would say, you know what? They were completely different in how they approached me. Completely different. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's kind of, you know, I think there's a lot of information around on how to read a horse's body language. But what I'm intent on teaching is how to read a horse's energy and then how we moderate our energy. And that's, the key.